Peter Pan by J. M. Barry. All children except one grow up. They soon know that they will grow up, and the way Wendy knew was this. One day, when she was two years old, she was playing in a garden, and she plucked another flower and ran with it to her mother. I suppose she must have looked rather delightful, for Mrs. Darling put her hand to her heart and cried, "Oh, why can't you remain like this for ever?" Henceforth, Wendy knew that she must grow up. You always know after your two. Two is the beginning of the end. Of course, they lived at number fourteen, and until Wendy came, her mother was the chief one. She was a lovely lady with a romantic mind and such a sweet mocking mouth. Her sweet mocking mouth had one kiss on it that Wendy could never get, though there it was, perfectly conspicuous in the right-hand corner. The way Mister Darling won her was this. The many gentlemen who had been boys when she was a girl discovered simultaneously that they loved her, and they all ran to her house to propose to her, except Mister Darling, who took a cab and nipped in first, and so he got her. Mister Darling used to boast to Wendy that her mother not only loved him but respected him. He was one of those deep ones who know about stocks and shares. Mrs. Darling was married in white, and at first she kept the books perfectly, almost gleefully, as if it were a game. Not so much as a Brussels sprout was missing. But by and by, whole cauliflowers dropped out, and instead of them, there were pictures of babies without faces. She drew them when she should have been totting up. They were Mrs. Darling's guesses. Wendy came first, then John, then Michael. And soon you might have seen the three of them going in a row to Miss Folsom's school, accompanied by their nurse. Mrs. Darling loved to have everything just so, and Mr. Darling had a passion for being exactly like his neighbours. So of course they had a nurse. As they were poor, this nurse was a prim Newfoundland dog called Nana, who had belonged to no one in particular until the Darlings engaged her. She proved to be a treasure of a nurse. How thorough she was at bath time, and up at any moment of the night if one of her charges made the slightest cry. No nursery could possibly have been conducted more correctly, and Mister Darling knew it. Yet he sometimes wondered uneasily whether the neighbours talked. He had his position in the city to consider. Nana also troubled him in another way. He had sometimes a feeling. That she did not admire him. I know she admires you tremendously, George. Mrs. Darling would assure him, and then she would sign the children to be specially nice to father. Lovely dances followed, in which the only other servant, Liza, was sometimes allowed to join. The gaiety of those romps, and gayest of all was Mrs. Darling, who would pirouette so wildly that all you could see of her was the kiss. There never was a simpler, happier family, until the coming of Peter Pan. Mrs. Darling first heard of Peter when she was tidying up her children's minds. It is the nightly custom of every good mother, after her children are asleep, to rummage in their minds and put things straight for next morning. I don't know whether you have ever seen a map of a person's mind. Doctors sometimes draw maps of other parts of you, but catch them trying to draw a map of a child's mind, which is not only confused but keeps going round all the time. There are zigzag lines on it, and these are probably roads in the island, for the Neverland is always more or less an island with astonishing splashes of colour here and there, and coral reefs, and rakish-looking craft in the offing, and savages, and lonely lairs, and gnomes who are mostly tailors. And caves through which a river runs. Of course, the Neverlands vary a good deal. John's, for instance, had a lagoon with flamingos flying over it, at which John was shooting, while Michael, who was very small, had a flamingo with lagoons flying over it. John lived in a boat turned upside down on the sands. Michael in a wigwam. Wendy in a house of leaves deftly sewed together. John had no friends. 
Michael had friends at night. Wendy had a pet wolf forsaken by its parents. But on the whole, the Neverlands have a family resemblance. Occasionally, in her travels through her children's minds, Mrs. Darling found things that she could not understand, and of these quite the most perplexing was the word Peter. She knew of no Peter, and yet here he was in John and Michael's minds, while Wendy's began to be scrawled all over with him. The name stood out in bolder letters than any of the other words, and as Mrs. Darling gazed, she felt it had an oddly cocky appearance. Yes, he is rather cocky, Wendy admitted with regret. Her mother had been questioning her. But who is he, my pet? He is Peter Pan, you know, mother. At first, Mrs. Darling did not know, but after thinking back into her childhood, she just remembered a Peter Pan who was said to live with the fairies. She had believed in him at the time, but now that she was married and full of sense, she quite doubted whether there was any such person. Besides, she said to Wendy, he would be grown up by this time. Oh, no, he isn't grown up, Wendy assured her confidently, and... He is just my size. Mrs. Darling consulted Mr. Darling, but he smiled. Poo, poo. Mark my words, he said. It will blow over. But it would not blow over, and soon the troublesome boy gave Mrs. Darling quite a shock. On the night we speak of, all the children were once more in bed. It happened to be Nana's evening off. And Mrs. Darling had bathed and sung to them till one by one they had let go her hand and slid away into the land of sleep. She smiled at her fears now and sat down tranquilly by the fire to sew. The fire was warm and presently the sewing lay on Mrs. Darling's lap. Her head nodded oh so gracefully. She was asleep. While she slept she had a dream. She dreamt that the Neverland had come too near, and that a strange boy had broken through from it. The dream itself would have been a trifle, but while she was dreaming, the window of the nursery blew open, and a boy did drop on the floor. He was accompanied by a strange light, no bigger than your fist, which darted about the room like a living thing, and I think it must have been this light that wakened Mrs. Darling. She started up with a cry, and saw the boy, and somehow she knew at once he was Peter Pan. If you or I or Wendy had been there, we should have seen that he was very like Mrs. Darling's kiss. He was a lovely boy, clad in skeleton leaves and the juices that ooze out of trees, but the most entrancing thing about him was that he had all his first teeth. When he saw she was a grown-up, he gnashed the little pearls at her. Mrs. Darling screamed, and as if in answer to a bell, the door opened and Nana entered, returning from her evening out. She growled and sprang at the boy, who leapt lightly through the window. Again Mrs. Darling screamed, this time in distress for him, for she thought he was killed, and she ran down into the street to look for his little body. But it was not there. She returned to the nursery and found Nana with something in her mouth, which proved to be the boy's shadow. As he leapt at the window, Nana had closed it quickly, too late to catch him, but his shadow had not had time to get out. Slam went the window and snapped it off. Mrs. Darling decided to roll the shadow up and put it away carefully in a drawer until a fitting opportunity came for telling her husband. The opportunity came a week later, on that never-to-be-forgotten Friday. I ought to have been specially careful on a Friday, Mrs. Darling used to say afterwards to her husband. No, no, Mr. Darling always said, I am responsible for it all. If only I had not accepted that invitation to dinner at twenty-seven, Mrs. Darling said. If only I had not poured my medicine into Nana's bowl, said Mr. Darling. They would sit there in the empty nursery, recalling fondly every smallest detail of that dreadful evening. 
It had begun so uneventfully, so precisely like a hundred other evenings, with Nana putting on the water for Michael's bath and carrying him to it on her back. Then Mrs. Darling had come in, wearing her white evening gown. She had dressed early because Wendy so loved to see her in her evening gown. It was then that I rushed in like a tornado, wasn't it? Mr. Darling would say, scorning himself. He too had been dressing for the party, and all had gone well with him until he came to his tie. It is an astounding thing to have to tell, but this man, though he knew about stocks and shares, had no real mastery of his tie. He came rushing into the nursery with a crumpled little brute of a tie in his hand. Why, what is the matter, father dear? Matter? he yelled. He really yelled. This tie! It will not tie! Mrs. Darling was placid. Let me try, dear, she said, and with her nice cool hands she tied his tie for him. He thanked her carelessly, at once forgot his rage, and in another moment was dancing round the room with Michael on his back. The romp had ended with the appearance of Nana. Mr. Darling began to talk again about its being a mistake to have a dog for a nurse. George, Nana is a treasure, no doubt, but I have an uneasy feeling at times that she looks upon the children as puppies. Oh, no, dear one, I feel sure she knows they have souls. I wonder, Mr. Darling said thoughtfully, I wonder... It was an opportunity, his wife felt, for telling him about the boy. At first he pooh-poohed the story, but he became thoughtful when she showed him the shadow. We were still discussing it, you remember, said Mr. Darling, when Nana came in with Michael's medicine. Strong man though he was, there is no doubt that he had behaved rather foolishly over the medicine. When Michael dodged the spoon in Nana's mouth, he had said reprovingly, Be a man, Michael. Wendy said to encourage Michael, That medicine you sometimes take, Father, is much nastier, isn't it? Ever so much nastier, Mr. Darling said bravely. And I would take it now as an example to you, Michael, if I hadn't lost the bottle. He had not exactly lost it, he had hidden it. What he did not know was that the faithful Liza had found it and put it back on his washstand. I know where it is, father, Wendy cried, always glad to be of service. John, Mr. Darling said, shuddering, it's most beastly stuff. It will soon be over, father, John said cheerily, and then in rushed Wendy with the medicine in a glass. Michael first, father said doggedly. Father first said Michael. Wendy had a splendid idea. Why not both take it at the same time? Certainly, said Mr. Darling. Are you ready, Michael? Wendy gave the words. One, two, three. And Michael took his medicine. But Mr. Darling slipped his behind his back. It was dreadful the way all the three were looking at him just as if they did not admire him. Look here, all of you, he said entreatingly, as soon as Nana had gone into the bathroom. I've just thought of a splendid joke. I shall pour my medicine into Nana's bowl, and she will drink it, thinking it is milk. It was the colour of milk. But the children did not have their father's sense of humour, and they looked at him reproachfully as he poured the medicine into Nana's bowl. What fun, he said doubtfully. They did not dare expose him when Mrs. Darling and Nana returned. Nana, good dog, he said, patting her. I have put a little milk into your bowl, Nana. Nana wagged her tail, ran to the medicine, and began lapping it. Then she gave Mr. Darling such a look. In a horrid silence, Mrs. Darling smelt the bowl. Oh, George, she said, it's your medicine. It was only a joke, he roared, while she comforted the boys. Wendy hugged Nana. 
Much good, he said bitterly, my wearing myself to the bone, trying to be funny in this house. And still Wendy hugged Nana. That's right, he shouted, cuddle her. Nobody cuddles me, oh dear, no. Well, I refuse to allow that dog to lord it in my nursery for an hour longer. George, George. Mrs. Darling whispered. Remember what I told you about that boy. Alas, he would not listen. When commands would not draw Nana from the kennel, he lured her out of it with honeyed words, and seizing her roughly, dragged her from the nursery. When he had tied her up in the backyard, the wretched father went and sat in the passage with his knuckles to his eyes. In the meantime, Mrs. Darling had put the children to bed in unwonted silence and lit their nightlights. For a moment after Mr. and Mrs. Darling left the house, the nightlights by the bed of the three children continued to burn clearly. They were awfully nice little nightlights, and one cannot help wishing that they could have kept awake to see Peter. But Wendy's light blinked and gave such a yawn that the other two yawned also, and before they could close their mouths, all the three went out. There was another light in the room now, a thousand times brighter than the night lights. And in the time we have taken to say this, it has been in all the drawers in the nursery, looking for Peter's shadow, rummaged the wardrobe and turned every pocket inside out. It was not really a light. It made this light by flashing about so quickly, but when it came to rest for a second, you saw it was a fairy. No longer than your hand, but still growing. It was a girl called Tinkerbell, exquisitely gowned in a skeleton leaf. A moment after the fairy's entrance, the window was blown open by the breathing of the little stars, and Peter dropped in. He had carried Tinkerbell part of the way, and his hand was still messy with the fairy dust. Tinkerbell, he called softly, after making sure the children were asleep. Do you know where they put my shadow? The loveliest tinkle as of golden bells answered him. It is the fairy language. Tink said that the shadow was in the big box. She meant the chest of drawers, and Peter jumped at the drawers, scattering their contents to the floor with both hands. In a moment he had recovered his shadow, and in his delight he forgot that he had shut Tinkerbell up in the drawer. He thought that he and his shadow would join like drops of water, but when they did not he was appalled. He tried to stick it on with soap from the bathroom, but that also failed. A shudder passed through Peter, and he sat on the floor and cried. His sobs woke Wendy, and she sat up in bed. She was not alarmed to see a stranger crying on the nursery floor. She was only pleasantly interested. Boy, she said courteously, why are you crying? Peter rose and bowed to her beautifully. What's your name? he asked. Wendy, Moira, Angela, darling, she replied with some satisfaction. What is your name? Peter Pan. She was already sure that he must be Peter, but it did seem a comparatively short name. Is that all? Yes, he said rather sharply. She asked where he lived. Second to the right, said Peter, and then straight on till morning. What a funny address. No, it isn't, he said. I mean, Wendy said nicely, is that what they put on the letters? Don't get any letters, he said contemptuously. But your mother gets letters. Don't have a mother, he said. Not only had he no mother, but he had not the slightest desire to have one. Oh, Peter, no wonder you were crying, Wendy said and got out of bed and ran to him. I wasn't crying about mothers, he said indignantly. I was crying because I can't get my shadow to stick on. Besides, I wasn't crying. It has come off? Yes. Then Wendy saw the shadow on the floor, 
and she saw that he'd been trying to stick it on with soap. Fortunately, she knew what to do. It must be sewn on, she said, just a little patronizingly. What's sewn? he asked. You are dreadfully ignorant. No, I'm not. I shall sew it on for you, my little man, she said, though he was as tall as herself. And she got out her hazif and sewed the shadow on to Peter's foot. Soon his shadow was behaving properly, though still a little creased. Peter was now jumping about in the wildest glee. Alas, he had already forgotten that he owed his bliss to Wendy. He thought he had attached the shadow himself. How clever I am! he crowed rapturously. Oh, the cleverness of me! It is humiliating to confess that this conceit of Peter was one of his most fascinating qualities. To put it with brutal frankness, there never was a cockier boy. But for the moment, Wendy was shocked. Your conceit! she exclaimed, with frightful sarcasm. Of course, I did nothing. You did a little, said Peter carelessly. If I am no use, I can at least withdraw. And she sprang in the most dignified way into the bed. Wendy, Peter said, don't withdraw. I can't help crowing when I'm pleased with myself. Wendy, one girl is more use than twenty boys. Do you really think so, Peter? Yes, I do. I think it's perfectly sweet of you, she declared, and I'll get up again. And she sat with him on the side of the bed. She said she would give him a kiss if he liked, but Peter did not know what she meant, and he held out his hand expectantly. Surely you know what a kiss is? she asked, aghast. I shall know when you give it to me, he replied stiffly, and not to hurt his feelings, she gave him a thimble. Now, said he, shall I give you a kiss? And she replied with Slight primness. If you please. She made herself rather cheap by inclining her face towards him, but he merely dropped an acorn button into her hand. So she slowly returned her face to where it had been before, and said nicely that she would wear his kiss on the chain round her neck. It was lucky that she did put it on that chain, for it was afterwards to save her life. Wendy asked Peter how old he was. It was not a really happy question to ask him. I don't know, he replied uneasily, but I'm quite young. I ran away the day I was born. Wendy was quite surprised, but interested. It was because I heard father and mother, he explained in a low voice, talking about what I was to be when I became a man. He was extraordinarily agitated now. I don't ever want to be a man, he said with passion. I want always to be a little boy and have fun. So I ran away to Kensington Gardens and lived a long, long time among the fairies. She gave him a look of the most intense admiration. And he thought it was because he had run away, but it was really because he knew fairies. Wendy poured out questions about them, and Peter told her about the beginning of fairies. You see, Wendy, when the first baby laughed for the first time, its laugh broke into a thousand pieces and they all went skipping about, and that was the beginning of fairies. And so, he went on good naturedly, there ought to be one fairy for every boy and girl. Ought to be? Isn't there? No. You see, children know such a lot now, they soon don't believe in fairies, and every time a child says, I don't believe in fairies, there is a fairy somewhere that falls down dead. It struck him that Tinkerbell was keeping very quiet. I can't think where she's gone to, he said, rising, and he called Tink by name. Wendy's heart went flutter with a sudden thrill. Peter, she cried, clutching him, you don't mean to tell me there is a fairy in this room? She's here just now, he said a little impatiently. You don't hear her, do you? And they both listened. The only sound I hear, said Wendy, is like a tinkle of bells. Well, that's tink, that's the fairy language. I think I hear her too. 
The sound came from the chest of drawers, and Peter made a merry face. No one could ever look quite so merry as Peter, and the loveliest of gurgles was his laugh. He had his first laugh still. Wendy, he said gleefully, I do believe I shut her up in the drawer. He let poor Tink out of the drawer, and she flew about the nursery, screaming with fury. Oh, Peter, cried Wendy, if only she would stand still and let me see her. They hardly ever stand still, he said. But for one moment Wendy saw the romantic figure come to rest on the cuckoo clock. Oh, the lovely, she cried, though Tink's face was still distorted with passion. Wendy plied him with more questions. If you don't live in Kensington Gardens now, sometimes I still do. But where do you live mostly now? With the lost boys. Who are they? They are the children who fall out of their perambulators when the nurse is looking the other way. If they're not claimed in seven days, they're sent far away to the Neverland to defray expenses. I'm captain. What fun it must be. Yes, said cunning Peter. But we are rather lonely. You see, we have no female companionship. Are none of the others girls? Oh, no. Girls, you know, are much too clever to fall out of their prams. This flattered Wendy immensely. I think, she said, you may give me a kiss. I thought you would want it back, he said a little bitterly, and offered to return her the thimble. Oh, dear, said the nice Wendy. I don't mean a kiss. I mean a thimble. What's that? It's like this. She kissed him. Funny, said Peter gravely. Now shall I give you a thimble? If you wish to, said Wendy, keeping her head erect this time. Peter thimbled her, and almost immediately she screeched. What is it, Wendy? It was exactly as if someone were pulling my hair. <laughs> that must have been Tink. I never knew her so naughty before. Peter could not understand why, but Wendy understood, and she was just slightly disappointed when he admitted that he came to the nursery window not to see her, but to listen to stories. Oh, Wendy, your mother was telling you such a lovely story. Which story was it? About the prince who couldn't find the lady who wore the glass slipper. Peter, said Wendy excitedly, that was Cinderella, and he found her, and they lived happily ever after. Peter was so glad that he rose from the floor where they'd been sitting and hurried to the window. Where are you going? she cried with misgiving. To tell the other boys. Don't go, Peter, she entreated. I know such lots of stories. Those were her precise words. So there can be no denying that it was she who first tempted him. He came back. And there was a greedy look in his eyes now, which ought to have warned her, but did not. Wendy, do come with me and tell the other boys. Oh, dear, I can't. Think of Mummy. Besides, I can't fly. I'll teach you. He'd become frightfully cunning. Wendy, he said. How we should all respect you. She was wriggling her body in distress. You could tuck us in at night. Oh, none of us has ever been tucked in at night. Oh, and her arms went out to him. And you could darn our clothes and make pockets for us. How could she resist? Peter, would you teach John and Michael to fly, too? If you like, he said indifferently. And she ran to John and Michael and shook them. Wake up, she cried. Peter Pan has come, and he is to teach us to fly. John rubbed his eyes. Then I shall get up, he said. Michael was up by this time also. Peter suddenly signed silence. Nana, who had been barking distressfully all evening, was quiet now. It was her silence they had heard. Out with the light, hide, quick, cried John, taking command for the only time throughout the whole adventure. And thus, when Liza entered, 
Holding Nana, the nursery seemed quite its old self. There, you suspicious brute, she said. They are perfectly safe, aren't they? Nana tried to drag herself out of Liza's clutches. No more of it, Nana, she said, pulling her out of the room. I warn you, if you bark again, I shall go straight for Master and Mrs. and bring them home from the party, and then, oh, won't Master whip you just. She tied the unhappy dog up again. But do you think Nana ceased to bark? Bring Master and Mrs. home from the party. Why, that was just what she wanted. Nana strained and strained at the chain, until at last she broke it. In another moment she had burst into the dining room of number 27 and flung her paws to heaven, her most expressive way of making a communication. Mr. and Mrs. Darling knew at once that something terrible was happening in their nursery, and without a good-bye to their hostess they rushed into the street. "'It's all right,' John announced, emerging from his hiding place. "'I say, Peter, can you really fly?' Instead of troubling to answer him, Peter flew round the room, taking in the mantelpiece on the way. It looked delightfully easy, and they tried it first from the floor and then from the beds, but they always went down instead of up. "'I say, how do you do it?' asked John, rubbing his knee. "'You just think lovely, wonderful thoughts,' Peter explained, "'and they lift you up in the air.' He showed them again. Not one of them could fly an inch. Of course, Peter had been trifling with them, for no one can fly unless the fairy dust has been blown on him. Fortunately, as we've mentioned, one of his hands was messy with it, and he blew some on each of them, with the most superb results. Up and down they went, and round and round. Heavenly was Wendy's word. I say, cried John, why shouldn't we all go out? Of course, it was to this that Peter had been luring them. It was just at this moment that Mr. and Mrs. Darling hurried with Nana out of number 27. They ran into the middle of the street to look up at the nursery window, and yes, it was still shut, but the room was ablaze with light, and most heart-gripping sight of all, they could see in shadow on the curtain three little figures in night attire circling round and round, not on the floor, but in the air. Not three figures, four. Once again the stars blew the window open, and then Peter knew there was not a moment to lose. Come, he cried imperiously, and soared out at once into the night, followed by John and Michael and Wendy. Mr. and Mrs. Darling and Nana rushed into the nursery too late. The birds were flown. Second to the right, and straight on till morning. That, Peter had told Wendy, was the way to the Neverland. But even birds carrying maps and consulting them at windy corners could not have sighted it with these instructions. Peter, you see, just said anything that came into his head. At first his companions trusted him implicitly, and so great were the delights of flying that they wasted time circling round church spires or any other tall objects on the way that took their fancy. Sometimes it was dark, and sometimes light and now they were very cold and again too warm. Did they really feel hungry at times, or were they merely pretending? Certainly they did not pretend to be sleepy. They were sleepy, and that was a danger, for the moment they popped off, down they fell. The awful thing was that Peter thought this was funny. There he goes again, he would cry gleefully as Michael suddenly dropped like a stone. "'Save him! Save him!' cried Wendy. Eventually Peter would dive through the air and catch Michael just before he struck the sea. Peter could sleep in the air without falling, by merely lying on his back and floating. "'Do be more polite to him,' Wendy whispered to John. "'Then tell him to stop showing off,' said John. When playing Follow My Leader, Peter would fly close to the water and touch each shark's tail in passing, just as in the street you may run your finger along an iron railing. They could not follow him in this with much success, so perhaps it was rather like showing off. So, with occasional tiffs, but on the whole rollicking, they drew near the Neverland. There it is, said Peter calmly. Where? Where? Where all the arrows are pointing. 
Indeed, a million golden arrows were pointing out the island to the children, all directed by their friend the sun, who wanted them to be sure of their way before leaving them for the night. Wendy and John and Michael all recognised it at once, and until fear fell upon them, hailed it, not as something long dreamt of and seen at last, but as a familiar friend to whom they were returning home for the holidays. "'I say, John, I see your flamingo with a broken leg.' "'Look, Michael, there's your cave.' "'John, what's that in the brushwood?' "'It's a wolf with her whelps. Wendy, I do believe that's your little whelp.' I say, John, I see the smoke of the redskin camp. Show me, and I'll tell you by the way the smoke curls whether they are on the warpath. There, just across the mysterious river. I see now, yes, they are on the warpath, right enough. Peter was a little annoyed with them for knowing so much. But if he wanted to lord it over them, his triumph was at hand. For have I not told you that anon fear fell upon them? It came as the arrows went, leaving the island in gloom. They had been flying apart, but they huddled close to Peter now. His careless manner had gone at last. His eyes were sparkling. A tingle went through them every time they touched his body. Tinker Bell had been asleep on his shoulder, but now he wakened her and sent her on in front. "'There's a pirate asleep in the pampas just beneath us,' Peter said. John said, "'How ripping!' and asked if there were many pirates on the island just now, and Peter said he had never known so many. "'Who is captain now?' "'Hook,' answered Peter, and his face became very stern as he said that hated word. "'James Hook?' "'Aye.' Then indeed Michael began to cry, and even John could speak in gulps only, for they knew Hook's reputation. "'He was Blackbeard's boatswain.' "'John whispered huskily. "'He is the worst of them all. "'He is the only man of whom Barbecue was afraid.' "'That's him,' said Peter. "'What is he like? Is he big?' "'He's not as big as he was.' "'How do you mean?' "'I cut off a bit of him.' "'You?' "'Yes, me,' said Peter sharply. "'I say, what bit? "'His right hand.' Then he can't fight now. Oh, can't he just? Left-hander? He has an iron hook instead of a right hand, and he claws with it. Claws? I say. For the moment they were feeling less eerie, because Tink was flying with them. She tells me, said Peter, that the pirates sighted us before the darkness came, and got Long Tom out. The big gun! Yes, and of course they must see Tink's light, and if they guess we are near it, they are sure to let fly. Then tell her, Wendy begged, to put out her light. She can't put it out. That is the only thing fairies can't do. It just goes out of itself when she falls asleep, same as the stars. If only one of us had a pocket, continued Peter, we could carry her in it. However, they had set off in such a hurry that there was not a pocket between the four of them. Peter had a happy idea. John's hat. Tink agreed to travel by hat if it was carried in the hand. Wendy took the hat, and this, as we shall see, led to mischief, for Tinkerbell hated to be under an obligation to Wendy. They flew on in silence. To Michael the loneliness was dreadful. If only something would make a sound, he cried. As if in answer to his request, the air was rent by the most tremendous crash he had ever heard. The pirates had fired Long Tom at them. When at last the heavens were steady again, John and Michael found themselves alone in the darkness. Peter had been carried by the wind of the shot far out to sea, while Wendy was blown upwards with no companion but Tinkerbell. It would have been well for Wendy if at that moment she had dropped the hat. I don't know whether the idea came suddenly to Tink, or whether she had planned it on the way, but she at once popped out of the hat and began to lure Wendy to her destruction. Tink was not all bad, or rather, 
She was all bad just now, but on the other hand, sometimes she was all good. At present, she was full of jealousy of Wendy. Wendy called to Peter and John and Michael, and got only mocking echoes in reply. She did not know that Tink hated her with the fierce hatred of a very woman, and so bewildered and now staggering in her flight, she followed Tink to her doom. Feeling that Peter was on his way back, the Neverland had again woke into life. On this evening, the chief forces of the island were disposed as follows. The lost boys were out looking for Peter. The pirates were out looking for the lost boys. The redskins were out looking for the pirates. And the beasts were out looking for the redskins. They were going round and round the island, but they did not meet because all were going at the same rate. At this time there were six boys, counting the twins as two. They are forbidden by Peter to look in the least like him, and they wear the skins of bears slain by themselves. The first to pass is Tootles, not the least brave, but the most unfortunate of all that gallant band. Poor, kind Tootles, there is danger in the air for you tonight. Wear Tinkerbell. Next comes Nibs, the gay and debonair, followed by Slightly, who cuts whistles out of the trees and dances ecstatically to his own tunes. Curly is fourth. He is a pickle. Last come the twins, who cannot be described because we should be sure to be describing the wrong one. The boys vanish into the gloom, and after a pause come the pirates on their track. A more villainous-looking lot never hung in a row on execution dock. Here, a little in advance, his great arms bare, pieces of eight in his ears as ornaments, is the handsome Italian Ketcho. Here is Bill Jukes, every inch of him tattooed, and Gentleman Starkey, once an usher in a public school and still dainty in his ways of killing. And the Irish boatswain Smee, an oddly genial man who stabbed, so to speak, without offence. And Noodler, and Alf Mason, and many another ruffian long known and feared on the Spanish main. In the midst of them reclined James Hook. He lay at his ease in a rough chariot drawn and propelled by his men. As dogs this terrible man treated and addressed them, and as dogs they obeyed him. In person he was cadaverous and black of eyes. And his hair was dressed in long curls. His eyes were of the blue of the forget me not, and of a profound melancholy, save when he was plunging his hook into you, at which time two red spots appeared in them and lit up horribly. But undoubtedly the grimmest part of him was his iron claw. Such is the terrible man against whom Peter is pitted. On the trail of the pirates, stealing noiselessly down the war path, come the redskins. These are the Piccaninny tribe. In the van, on all fours, is great big little panther, a brave of so many scalps that in his present position they somewhat impede his progress. Bringing up the rear, the place of greatest danger, comes Tiger Lily, proudly erect, a princess in her own right. She is the most beautiful of dusky Dianas, and the belle of the Piccaninnies, coquettish, cold and amorous by turns. The redskins disappear as they have come, like shadows, and soon their place is taken by the beasts, a great and motley procession. When they have passed comes the last figure of all, a gigantic crocodile. We shall see for whom she is looking presently. The first to fall out of the circle were the boys. They flung themselves down on the sward close to their underground home. I do wish Peter would come back, every one of them said nervously. While they talked, they heard a distant sound. It was the grim song. Yo ho, yo ho, the pirate life, the flag goes skull and bones. A merry hour, a hempen rope, and hey for Davy Jones! At once the lost boys. But where are they? 
They are no longer there. I will tell you where they are. With the exception of Nibs, who has darted away to reconnoitre, they are already in their home under the ground, a very delightful residence, of which we shall see a good deal presently. But how have they reached it? For there is no entrance to be seen. Look closely, however, and you may note that there are here seven large trees, each having in its hollow trunk a hole as large as a boy. These are the seven entrances to the home under the ground, for which Hook has been searching in vain these many moons. As the pirates advanced, the quick eye of Starkey sighted Nibs disappearing through the wood, and at once his pistol flashed out, but an iron claw gripped his shoulder. Now, for the first time, we hear the voice of Hook. It was a black voice. Put back that pistol, it said threateningly. It was one of those boys you hate. I could have shot him dead. Aye, and the sound would have brought Tiger Lily's redskins upon us. Do you want to lose your scalp? Shall I after him, Captain? asked pathetic Smee. Not now, Smee, said Hook darkly. He is the only one, and I want to mischief all the seven. Scatter and look for them. The pirates disappeared among the trees, and in a moment their captain and Smee were alone. Hook heaved a heavy sigh. There came over him a desire to confide to his faithful boatswain the story of his life. He spoke long and earnestly, but what it was all about, Smee, who was rather stupid, did not know in the least. Anon he caught the word Peter. Most of all, Hook was saying passionately, I want their Captain Peter Pan. Twas he cut off my arm and flung it to a crocodile that happened to be passing by. I have often, said Smee, noticed your strange dread of crocodiles. Not of crocodiles, Hook corrected him, but of that one crocodile. He'd like my arm so much, Smee, that it has followed me ever since. In a way, said Smee, it's a sort of compliment. I want no such compliments, Hook barked petulantly. I want Peter Pan. He sat down on a large mushroom. Smee, he said huskily. That crocodile would have had me before this, but by a lucky chance it swallowed a clock which goes tick, tick inside, and so before it can reach me I hear the tick and bolt. Some day, said Smee, the clock will run down, and then he'll get you. Hook wetted his dry lips. Aye, he said, that's the fear that haunts me. Sitting down, he had felt curiously warm. Smee, he said, this seat is hot. He jumped up. Odds, bobs, hammer and tongs, I'm burning. They examined the mushroom. They tried to pull it up and it came away at once in their hands, for it had no root. Stranger still. Smoke began at once to ascend. The pirates looked at each other. A chimney, they both exclaimed. They had indeed discovered the chimney of the home under the ground. Not only smoke came out of it, there came also children's voices. The pirates listened grimly and then replaced the mushroom. Did you hear them say that Peter Pan's from home? Smee whispered. Hook nodded. Unrip your plan, Captain, said Smee. To return to the ship, Captain Hook replied, and cook a large rich cake of a jolly thickness with green sugar on it. We will leave the cake on the shore of the mermaid's lagoon. These boys will gobble it up because they have no mother and they don't know how dangerous it is to eat rich, damp cake. He burst into laughter. <laughs> they will Die. And then, suddenly, tick, 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 tick. Hook stood shuddering, 
one foot in the air. The crocodile, he gasped, and bounded away, followed by his bosun. The crocodile oozed on after Hook. Once more the boys emerged into the open. Presently Nibs rushed breathless into their midst. I've seen a wonderful thing, he cried as they gathered round him eagerly. A great white bird! It is flying this way! What kind of bird do you think? I don't know, said Nibs awestruck, but it looks so weary, and as it flies it moans, Poor Wendy! Wendy was now almost overhead, and they could hear her plaintive cry, but more distinct came the shrill voice of Tinkerbell. Hello, Tink! cried the wondering boys. Tink's reply rang out. Peter wants you to shoot the Wendy! All but Tootles popped down their trees. He had a bow and arrow with him, and Tink noted it and rubbed her little hands. Quick, Tootles, quick! she screamed. Peter will be so pleased! Tootles fired, and Wendy fluttered to the ground with an arrow in her breast. Foolish Tootles was standing like a conqueror over Wendy's body when the other boys sprang armed from their trees. You are too late, he said proudly. I have shot the Wendy. Peter will be so pleased with me. They had crowded round Wendy. Slightly was the first to speak. This is no bird. I think she must be a lady. Now I see, said Curly, Peter was bringing her to us. A lady to take care of us at last, said one of the twins, and you have killed her. Tootle's face was very white, but there was a dignity about him now that had never been there before. He moved slowly away. Don't go, they called in pity. I must, he answered, shaking. I'm so afraid of Peter. It was at this tragic moment that they heard a sound which made the heart of every one of them rise to his mouth. They heard Peter crow, and he dropped in front of them. Greetings, boys, he cried, and mechanically they saluted, and then again was silence. Peter frowned. Great news, boys, he cried. I have brought at last a mother for you all. Still no sound. Have you not seen her? asked Peter, becoming troubled. She flew this way. Tootles rose. Peter, he said quietly, I will show her to you. They all stood back and let him see. And after he had looked for a little time, he did not know what to do next. She is dead, he said uncomfortably. He took the arrow from her heart, and faced his band. Whose arrow? he demanded sternly. Mine, Peter, said Tootles on his knees. Oh, dastard hand, Peter said, and he raised the arrow to use it as a dagger. Tootles did not flinch. He bared his breast. Strike, Peter, he said firmly. Strike true. Twice did Peter raise the arrow, and twice did his hand fall. I cannot strike, he said with awe. There is something stays my hand. All looked at him in wonder, save Nibs, who fortunately looked at Wendy. It is she, he cried, the Wendy lady, see her arm. Wonderful to relate, Wendy had raised her arm. She lives, Peter said briefly. Then he knelt beside her and found his button. You remember, she had put it on a chain that she wore round her neck. See, he said, the arrow struck against this. It is the kiss I gave her. It has saved her life. From overhead came a wailing note. Listen to Tink, said Curly. She's crying because the Wendy lives. Then they had to tell Peter of Tink's crime, and almost never had they seen him look so stern. Listen, Tinkerbell, he cried. I am your friend no more. Be gone from me for ever. She flew onto his shoulder and pleaded, but he brushed her off. Not until Wendy again raised her arm did he relent sufficiently to say, Well, not forever, but for a whole week. Do you think Tinkerbell was grateful to Wendy for raising her arm? 
Oh, dear, no, never wanted to pinch her so much. But what to do with Wendy in her present delicate state of health? Let us build a little house round her, cried Peter. They were all delighted, and in a moment they were as busy as tailors the night before a wedding. While they were at it, who should appear but John and Michael? You may be sure they were very relieved to find Peter. Hello, Peter, they said. Hello, replied Peter amicably, though he had forgotten them. Curly, he said in his most captaincy voice, see that these boys help in the building of the house. The astounded brothers were dragged away to hack and hew and carry. The branches they had brought were sticky with red sap, and all the ground was carpeted with moss, and they rattled up the little house. It was quite beautiful, and no doubt Wendy was very cosy within, though, of course, they could no longer see her. Nothing remained to do but to knock. All look your best, Peter warned them. First impressions are awfully important. He knocked politely, and now the wood was as still as the children, not a sound to be heard except from Tinkerbell, who was watching from a branch and openly sneering. The door opened, and a lady came out. It was Wendy. She looked properly surprised. Where am I? she said. Wendy, lady, slightly said rapidly, for you we built this house. Lovely, darling house, Wendy said. And they all went on their knees and holding out their arms and cried, Oh, Wendy lady, be our mother. Ought I? Wendy said. I'm only a little girl. I've no real experience. That doesn't matter, said Peter. Very well, Wendy said. I will do my best. Come inside at once, you naughty children. I'm sure your feet are damp. And before I put you to bed, I have just time to finish the story of Cinderella. And that was the first of the many joyous evenings they had with Wendy. By and by, she tucked them up in the great bed in the home under the trees, and she herself slept that night in the little house, and Peter kept watch outside with drawn sword. One of the first things Peter did next day was to measure Wendy and John and Michael for hollow trees. Unless your tree fitted you, it was difficult to go up and down, and no two boys were quite the same size. Peter measures you for your tree as carefully as for a suit of clothes, the only difference being that the clothes are made to fit you, while you have to be made to fit the tree. Usually it's done quite easily as by your wearing too many garments or too few, but if you are bumpy in awkward places, or the only available tree is an odd shape, Peter does some things to you, and after that you fit. Wendy and Michael fitted their trees at the first try, but John had to be altered a little. After a few days' practice, they could go up and down as gaily as buckets in a well, and how ardently they grew to love their home under the ground, especially Wendy. It consisted of one large room, as all houses should do. There was an enormous fireplace, and across this Wendy stretched strings made of fibre from which she suspended her washing. The bed was tilted against the wall by day, and let down at six-thirty, when it filled nearly half the room, and all the boys except Michael slept in it. Michael was hung up in a basket. There was one recess in the wall, which was the private apartment of Tinkerbell. She was very contemptuous of the rest of the house, as indeed was perhaps inevitable, and her chamber, though beautiful, looked rather conceited, having the appearance of a nose permanently turned up. I suppose it was all especially entrancing to Wendy, because those rampageous boys of hers gave her so much to do. Really, there were whole weeks when, except perhaps with a stocking in the evening, she was never above ground. Wendy's favourite time for sewing and darning was after they'd all gone to bed. Then, as she expressed it, she had a breathing time for herself.
As time wore on, did she think much about the beloved parent she had left behind her? This is a difficult question because it is quite impossible to say how time does wear on in the Neverland. I'm afraid that Wendy did not really worry about her father and mother. She was absolutely confident that they would always keep the window open for her to fly back by, and this gave her complete ease of mind. What did disturb her at times was that John remembered his parents vaguely only, while Michael was quite willing to believe that she was really his mother. These things scared her a little, and, nobly anxious to do her duty, she tried to fix the old life in their minds by setting them examination papers on it. The other boys thought this awfully interesting and insisted on joining in. Peter did not compete. For one thing, he despised all mothers except Wendy, and for another, he was the only boy on the island who could neither write nor spell. If you shut your eyes and are a lucky one, you may see at times a shapeless pool of lovely pale colours suspended in the darkness. Then, if you squeeze your eyes tighter, the pool begins to take shape, and the colours become so vivid that with another squeeze they must go on fire. But just before they go on fire, you see the lagoon. This is the nearest you ever get to it on the mainland, just one heavenly moment. If there could be two moments, you might see the surf and hear the mermaids singing. The children often spent long summer days on this lagoon, swimming or floating most of the time, playing games with the mermaids in the water, and so forth. You must not think from this that the mermaids were on friendly terms with them. On the contrary, it was among Wendy's lasting regrets that all the time she was on the island, she never had a civil word from one of them. They treated all the boys in the same way, except, of course, Peter, who chatted with them on Maruna's rock. It must have been rather pretty to see the children resting on a rock for half an hour after their midday meal. They lay there in the sun, and their bodies glistened in it, while Wendy sat beside them and looked important. It was one such day, and they were all on Maruna's rock. Wendy was very busy stitching. While she stitched, a change came over the lagoon. Little shivers ran over it, and the sun went away, and shadows stole across the water, turning it cold. It was not, she knew, that night had come, but something as dark as night had come. What was it? Of course, she should have roused the children at once, but she was a young mother. So, although fear was upon her, she did not waken the boys. Even when she heard the sound of muffled oars, she did not waken them. It was well for those boys that there was one among them who could sniff danger even in his sleep. Peter sprang erect, and with one warning cry he roused the others. Pirates! he cried. The others came closer to him. A strange smile was playing about his face, and Wendy saw it and shuddered. His orders came sharply. And incisive. Dive! There was a gleam of legs, and instantly the lagoon seemed deserted. Maruna's rock stood alone in the forbidding waters. The boat drew nearer. It was the pirate dinghy, with three figures in her, Smee and Starkey, and the third a captive, no other than Tiger Lily. Her hands and ankles were tied, and she knew what was to be her fate. She was to be left on the rock to perish. They had caught her boarding the pirate ship with a knife in her mouth. In the gloom that they brought with them, the two pirates did not see the rock till they crashed into it. It was the work of one brutal moment to land the beautiful girl on the rock. She was too proud to offer a vain resistance. Quite near the rock, but out of sight, two heads were bobbing up and down, Peter's and Wendy's. There was almost nothing Peter could not do, and now he imitated the voice of Hook. Ahoy there, you lubbers, he called. It was a marvellous imitation. The captain, said the pirates. We are putting the redskin on the rock, Smee called out. Set her free, came the astonishing answer. Free? Yes, cut her bonds and let her go. Better do what the captain orders, said Starkey nervously. 
Hi, hi, Smee said, and he cut Tiger Lily's cords. At once, like an eel, she slid between Starkey's legs into the water. Boat ahoy! rang over the lagoon in Hook's voice, and this time it was not Peter who had spoken. The real Hook was also in the water. He was swimming to the boat, and his men showed a light to guide him. Wendy saw his hook grip the boat's side. She saw his evil, swarthy face as he rose, dripping from the water. Peter would not budge. He signed to Wendy to listen. What's up, Captain? said Smee. The game's up, he cried. Those boys have found a mother. Affrighted though she was, Wendy swelled with pride. Captain, said Smee, could we not kidnap these boys' mother and make her our mother? It is a princely scheme, cried Hook, and at once it took practical shape in his great brain. We will seize the children and carry them to the boat. The boys we will make walk the plank, and Wendy shall be our mother. Wendy forgot herself. Never, she cried and bobbed. What was that? But they could see nothing. Suddenly, Hook remembered Tiger Lily. Where is the redskin? He asked abruptly.、Uh, that's all right, Captain. Smee answered complacently. We let her go. Let her go! Cried Hook. You called over the water to us to let her go, said Starkey. Brimstone and gall! Thundered Hook. What cousin in his ear? His face had gone black with rage. Lads, he said, shaking a little. I gave no such order. It is passing queer, said Smee. Spirit that haunts this dark lagoon tonight, Hook cried. Dost hear me? Of course, Peter should have kept quiet, but of course he did not. He immediately answered in Hook's voice. Odds, bobs, hammer and tongs, I hear you. Who are you, stranger? Speak! Hook demanded. I am James Hook," replied the voice, "captain of the Jolly Roger." You are not. You are not," Hook cried hoarsely. Suddenly, he tried the guessing game. Hook," he called, "have you another voice?" Now Peter could never resist a game, and he answered blithely in his own voice, "I have." And another name? Hi, hi. Man? Asked Hook. No. The answer rang out scornfully. Boy? Yes. Ordinary boy? No. Wonderful boy. Yes. Are you in England? No. Are you here? Yes. Hook was completely puzzled. Can't you guess? Can't you guess? Crowed Peter. Do you give it up? Yes. Yes. Well then, he cried. I am Peter Pan. Pan. Now we have him! Hook shouted. Into the water, Smee. Starkey, mind the boat. Take him, dead or alive. He leapt as he spoke, and simultaneously came the gay voice of Peter. Are you ready, boys? Ay, ay! From various parts of the lagoon. Then lamb into the pirates. The fight was short and sharp. Here and there, a head bobbed up in the water, and there was a flash of steel followed by a cry or a whoop. Hook rose to the rock to breathe, and at the same moment, Peter scaled it on the opposite side. Each feeling for a grip met the other's arm. In surprise, they raised their heads; their faces were almost touching. So they met. A few minutes afterwards, the boys saw Hook in the water, striking wildly for the ship. No elation on his pestilent face now. Only white fear, for the crocodile was in dogged pursuit of him. The boys found the dinghy and went home in it, shouting, "Peter, Wendy!" as they went. Great were the rejoicings when Peter reached home underground. 
Every boy had adventures to tell, but perhaps the biggest adventure of all was that they were several hours late for bed. One important result of the brush on the lagoon was that it made the redskins their friends. Peter had saved Tiger Lily from a dreadful fate, and now there was nothing she and her braves would not do for him. All night they sat above, keeping watch over the home under the ground, and awaiting the big attack by the pirates, which obviously could not be much longer delayed. Even by day they hung about, smoking the pipe of peace. We have now reached the evening that was to be known among them as the Night of Nights, because of its adventures and their upshot. The day had been almost uneventful. The children were having their evening meal. All except Peter, who had gone out to get the time. The way you got the time on the island was to find the crocodile and then stay near him till the clock struck. Wendy told the boys to clear away and sat down to her work basket, a heavy load of stockings and every knee with a hole in it as usual. There was a step above, and Wendy, you may be sure, was the first to recognise it. Children, I hear your father's step. He likes you to meet him at the door. Peter had brought nuts for the boys as well as the correct time for Wendy. Peter, you just spoil them, you know. Wendy simpered. Ay, old lady," said Peter, hanging up his gun. It was me told him mothers are called old lady," Michael whispered to Curly. The first twin came to Peter. Father, we want to dance. Dance away, my little man," said Peter. Was in high good humour, but we want you to dance. <laughs> Me, my old bones would rattle, and Mummy too. What? cried Wendy. The mother of such an armful dance. But on a Saturday night, slightly insinuated. It was not really Saturday night. At least it may have been, for they had long lost count of the days. But always, if they wanted to do anything special, they said this was Saturday night, and they did it. So they were told they could dance, but they must put on their nighties first. Ah,、oh, old lady," said Peter aside to Wendy, warming himself by the fire and looking down at her as she sat turning a heel. "There is nothing more pleasant of an evening for you and me when the day's toil is done than to rest by the fire with the little ones near by." "It is sweet, Peter, isn't it?" Wendy said, frightfully gratified. "Peter." I think Curly has your nose. Michael takes after you. She went to him and put her hand on his shoulder. Dear Peter, she said, with such a large family, of course, I have now passed my best. But you don't want to change me, do you? No, Wendy. Certainly, he did not want to change, but he looked at her uncomfortably. Peter, what is it? I was just thinking," he said, a little scared. "It is only make believe, isn't it, that I'm their father?" "Oh yes," Wendy said primly. "You see," he continued apologetically, "it would make me seem so old to be their real father." "But they are ours, Peter, yours and mine, but not really, Wendy," he asked anxiously. "Not if you don't wish it," she replied. And she distinctly heard his sigh of relief. Peter, she asked, trying to speak firmly, "What are your exact feelings for me?" "Those of a devoted son, Wendy." "I thought so," she said, and went and sat by herself at the extreme end of the room. "You're so queer." He said, frankly puzzled, and Tiger Lily is just the same. There's something she wants to be to me, but she says it's not my mother. No, indeed, it is not. Wendy snapped. Fancy Wendy snapping! But she'd been much tried, and she little knew what was to happen before the night was out. If she had known, she would not have snapped. As it was to be their last hour on the island, let us rejoice that there were sixty minutes in it. They sang and danced in their nightgowns. The stories they told before it was time for Wendy's good night story, and then at last they all got into bed for Wendy's story—the story they loved best.
the story Peter hated. Usually he left the room, but tonight he remained on his stool, and we shall see what happened. Listen then, said Wendy, settling down to her story, with Michael at her feet and seven boys in bed. There was once a gentleman. I'd rather he'd been a lady, Curly said. Quiet, their mother admonished them. There was a lady also. Oh, Mummy, cried the first twin, you mean there is a lady also, don't you? She's not dead, is she? Oh, no. I'm awfully glad she isn't dead, said Tootles. Little less noise there, Peter called out. The gentleman's name, continued Wendy, was Mr. Darling, and her name was Mrs. Darling, and they had three descendants. What is descendants? Descendants are only children, said John. Oh dear, oh dear, sighed Wendy. Now, these three children had a faithful nurse called Nana, but Mr. Darling was angry with her and chained her up in the yard, and so all the children flew away. It's an awfully good story, said Nibs. They flew away, Wendy continued, to the Neverland, where the lost children are. Oh, Wendy, cried Tootles, was one of the lost children called Tootles? Yes, he was. I'm in a story. Hurrah! I'm in a story, Nibs. Hush. Now, I want you to consider the feelings of the unhappy parents, with all their children flown away. It's awfully sad, the first twin said cheerfully. I'm frightfully anxious, said Nibs. If you knew how great is a mother's love, Wendy told them triumphantly, you would have no fear. She had now come to the part that Peter hated. You see, Wendy said complacently, our heroine knew that the mother would always leave the window open for her children to fly back by. So they stayed away for years and had a lovely time. Peter uttered a hollow groan. What is it, Peter? she cried, running to him. Wendy, you are wrong about mothers. They all gathered round him in a fright, so alarming was his agitation. Long ago, he said, I thought like you that my mother would always keep the window open for me. So I stayed away for moons and moons and moons, and then flew back, but the window was barred, for my mother had forgotten about me. And there was another little boy sleeping in my bed. I'm not sure this was true, but Peter thought it was true, and it scared them. Wendy, let's go home, cried John and Michael together. Yes, she said, clutching them. Not tonight, asked the lost boys, bewildered. At once, Wendy replied resolutely, for the horrible thought had come to her. Perhaps Mother is in half mourning by this time. This dread made her forgetful of what must be Peter's feelings, and she said to him rather sharply, Peter, Will you make the necessary arrangements? If you wish it, he replied as coolly as if she'd asked him to pass the nuts. If she did not mind the parting, he was going to show her was Peter that neither did he. But of course he cared very much. Tinkerbell will take you across the sea. Wake her, Nibs. Nibs had to knock twice before he got an answer, though Tink had really been sitting up in bed listening for some time. She had been delighted to hear that Wendy was going. In the meantime, the boys were gazing very forlornly at Wendy, now equipped with John and Michael for the journey. Dear ones, said Wendy, if you will all come with me, I feel almost sure I can get my father and mother to adopt you. The invitation was meant specially for Peter, but each of the boys was thinking exclusively of himself, and at once they jumped for joy. Peter, can we go? they all cried imploringly. All right, Peter replied with a bitter smile, and immediately they rushed to get their things. Get your things, Peter, Wendy cried, shaking. No, he answered, pretending indifference. I'm not going with you, Wendy. Yes, Peter, no, but Peter, no. And so the others had to be told. Peter? isn't coming. Peter not coming. They gazed blankly at him, their sticks over their backs, and on each stick a bundle. 
Now then, cried Peter, no fuss, no blubbering. Goodbye, Wendy. And he held out his hand cheerily. For it was at this moment that the pirates made their dreadful attack upon the redskins. Above, the air was rent with shrieks and the clash of steel. Below, there was dead silence. All arms were extended to Peter. He seized his sword, and the lust of battle was in his eyes. The pirate attack had been a complete surprise, a sure proof that the unscrupulous hook had conducted it improperly. It is no part of ours to describe what was a massacre rather than a fight. Thus perished many of the flower of the Piccaninny tribe. Not all unavenged did they die, for with Lean Wolf fell Alf Mason, and among the others who bit the dust were George Scowry, Turley, and the Alsatian Fogarty. The night's work was not yet over, for it was not the Redskins who had come out to destroy. It was Pan he wanted, Pan and Wendy and their band, but chiefly Pan. Peter was such a small boy that one tends to wonder at the man's hatred of him. True, he had flung Hook's arm to the crocodile, but the truth is that there was something about Peter which goaded the pirate captain to frenzy. It was Peter's cockiness. In the meantime, what of the boys? The pandemonium above had ceased, almost as suddenly as it arose. Which side is won? The pirates, listening avidly at the mouth of the trees, heard the question put by every boy. And alas, they also heard Peter's answer. If the redskins have won, he said, they will beat the tom-tom. It is always their sign of victory. Now Smee had found the tom-tom and was sitting on it. To his amazement, Hook signed to him to beat it. Twice Smee beat upon the instrument and then stopped to listen gleefully. The tom-tom, the miscreants heard Peter cry. An Indian victory! The doomed children answered with a cheer. Silently, Hook gave his orders, a man to each tree and the others to arrange themselves in a line two yards apart. The more quickly this horror is disposed of, the better. The first to emerge from his tree was Curly. He was tossed from one pirate to another till he fell at the feet of the black pirate. All the boys were plucked from their trees in this ruthless manner. A different treatment was accorded to Wendy, who came last. With ironical politeness, Hook raised his hat to her, and offering her his arm, escorted her to the spot where the others were being gagged. The boys were tied to prevent their flying away. The black pirate had cut a rope into nine equal pieces. All went well until Slightly's turn came, when he was found to be like those irritating parcels that use up all the string. Every time they tried to pack the unhappy lad tight in one part, he bulged out in another. Hook's master mind had gone far beneath Slightly's surface, probing not for effects, but for causes, and his exultation showed that he had found them. Slightly, white to the gills, knew that Hook had surprised his secret, which was this, that no boy so blown out would use a tree wherein an average man needs stick. Poor Slightly, most wretched of all the children now, for he was in a panic about Peter, bitterly regretted what he had done. Madly addicted to the drinking of water when he was hot, he had swelled in consequence to his present girth, and instead of reducing himself to fit his tree, unknown to the others, had whittled his tree to make it fit him. Sufficient of this Hook guessed to persuade him that Peter at last lay at his mercy. He signed that the captives were to be conveyed to the ship, and that he would be alone. The first thing he did on finding himself alone in the fast-falling night was to tiptoe to Slightly's tree and make sure that it provided him with a passage. He let his cloak slip softly to the ground and stepped into the tree. Silently, he let himself go into the unknown. He arrived unmolested at the foot of the shaft and stood still. As his eyes became accustomed to the dim light, various objects in the home under the trees took shape. 
but the only one on which his greedy gaze rested, long sought for and found at last, was the great bed. On the bed lay Peter, fast asleep. Unaware of the tragedy being enacted above, Peter had continued for a little time after the children left to play gaily on his pipes. Then he decided not to take his medicine so as to grieve Wendy. Then he lay down on the bed and had fallen into a dreamless sleep. Thus, defenceless, Hook found him. Lest he should be taken alive, Hook always carried about his person a dreadful drug. Five drops of this he now added to Peter's cup. Then one long, gloating look he cast upon his victim, and turning, wormed his way with difficulty up the tree. He wound his cloak around him and stole away through the trees. It must have been not less than ten o'clock by the crocodile when Peter suddenly sat up in his bed, wakened by he knew not what. It was a soft, cautious tapping on the door of his tree. Who is that? No answer. I won't open unless you speak, Peter cried. Then at last the visitor spoke in a lovely bell-like voice. Let me in, Peter. It was Tink, and quickly he unbarred to her. She flew in excitedly, her face flushed and her dress stained with mud. What is it? She told of the capture of Wendy and the boys. I'll rescue her, he cried, leaping at his weapon. As he leapt, he thought of something he could do to please Wendy. He could take his medicine. His hand closed on the fatal draught. No, shrieked Tinkerbell, who had heard Hook muttering about his deed as he sped through the forest. Why not? It is poisoned. Poisoned? Who could have poisoned it? Hook! Don't be silly. How could Hook have got down here? Alas, Tinkerbell could not explain this, for even she did not know the dark secret of Slightly's tree. Peter raised the cup. With one of her lightning movements, Tink got between his lips and the draught and drained it to the dregs. Why, Tink, how dare you drink my medicine? But she did not answer. Already she was reeling in the air. What's the matter with you? cried Peter, suddenly afraid. It was poisoned, Peter, she told him softly. Oh, Tink, did you drink it to save me? Yes. But why, Tink? She whispered in his ear. You silly ass. And then, tottering to her chamber, lay down on the bed. His head almost filled the fourth wall of her little room as he knelt near her in distress. Her voice was so low that at first he could not make out what she said. Then he made it out. She was saying that she thought she could get well again if children believed in fairies. Peter flung out his arms. There were no children there, and it was night time, but he addressed all who might be dreaming of the Neverland. Do you believe? he cried. Tink sat up in bed briskly to listen to her fate. She fancied she heard answers in the affirmative, and then again she wasn't sure. What do you think? she asked Peter. If you believe, he shouted to them, clap your hands. Don't let Tink die. Many clapped. Some didn't. A few little beasts hissed. The clapping stopped suddenly, as if countless mothers had rushed to their nurseries to see what on earth was happening. But already Tink was saved. And now to rescue Wendy! One green light squinting over Kid's Creek, which is near the mouth of the Pirate River, marked where the brig the Jolly Roger lay low in the water. She was wrapped in the blanket of night through which no sound from her could have reached the shore. Hook trod the deck in thought. It was his hour of triumph. Peter had been removed from ever from his path, and all the other boys were in the brig about to walk the plank. It was his grimmest deed since the days when he had brought barbecue to heel. Are all the children chained so they cannot fly away? Aye, aye, then hoist them up. wretched prisoners were dragged from the hold 
all except Windy, and ranged in line in front of him. Now then, bullies, he said briskly, six of you walk the plank tonight, but I have room for two cabin boys. Which of you is it to be? Don't irritate him unnecessarily, had been Wendy's instructions in the hold. So Tootle stepped forward politely. You see, sir, I don't think my mother would like me to be a pirate. You boy, Hook said, addressing John. Didst never want to be a pirate, my hearty? I once thought of calling myself Red-Handed Jack, he said diffidently. And a good name, too. Will you call you that here bully if you join? Shall we still be respectful subjects of the king? John inquired. Through Hook's teeth came the answer. You would have to swear down with a king. Then I refuse, John cried. Hook roared out. That seals your doom. Bring up their mother. Get a plank ready. Wendy was brought up. And no words of mine can tell you how she despised those pirates. So, my beauty, said Hook, you are to see your children walk the plank. Tie her up, he shouted. It was Smee who tied her to the mast. It is sad to know that not a boy was looking at her as Smee tied her to the mast. The eyes of all were on the plank, that last little walk they were about to take. Hook smiled on them with his teeth closed and took a step towards Wendy. His intention was to turn her face so that she should see the boys walking the plank one by one. But he never reached her. He never heard the cry of anguish he hoped to wring from her. He heard something else instead. It was the terrible tick, tick of the crocodile. The sound came steadily nearer and in advance of it came this ghastly thought. The crocodile is about to board the ship. Hook crawled on his knees along the deck as far from the sound as he could go. Hide me, he cried hoarsely. The pirates gathered round him. Only when Hook was hidden from them did curiosity loosen the limbs of the boys so that they could rush to the ship's side to see the crocodile climbing it. Then they got the strangest surprise of this night of nights, for it was no crocodile that was coming to their aid. It was Peter. He signed to them not to give vent to any cry of admiration that might arouse suspicion. Then he went on ticking. It was at this moment that Ed Taint emerged from the forecastle and came along the deck. Now, reader, time what happened by your watch. Peter struck true and deep. John clapped his hands on the ill-fated pirate's mouth to stifle the dying groan. He fell forward. Four boys caught him to prevent the thud. Peter gave the signal, and the carrion was cast overboard. How long has it taken? One, slightly, had begun to count. Peter vanished into the cabin. Hook drew himself up firmly to his full height. Do you want a touch of the cat before you walk the plank? At that, the boys fell on their knees. No, no, they cried. Fetch the cat, Jukes, said Hook. It's in the cabin. The cabin? Peter was in the cabin. The children gazed at each other. There was a dreadful screech from the cabin. Then was heard a crowing sound which was well understood by the boys. What was that? cried Hook. Two, said slightly, solemnly. The Italian Gecho then swung into the cabin. He tottered out, haggard. Bill Jukes is dead, stabbed, he said. The cabin is as black as a pit and there's something terrible in there, the thing you heard the crowing. Gecho said Hook, go back and fetch out that doodle do. Gecho went. All listened. Again came a death screech, and again a crow. No one spoke except slightly. Three, he said. Wait till Ketcho comes out, growled Starkey. I think I heard you volunteer, Starkey, said Hook. I'll swing before I go in there, said Starkey. Is it mutiny? asked Hook. Starkey looked round for help, but all deserted him. As he backed, Hook advanced, and now the red spark was in his eye. 
With a despairing scream, the pirate leapt upon Long Tom and precipitated himself into the sea. Four, said Slightly. The mutinous sounds again broke forth. One after another took up the cry, The ship's doomed! At this the children could not resist a cheer. Lads, said Hook, here's an ocean. Open the cabin door and drive them in. The boys, pretending to struggle, were pushed into the cabin and the door was closed on them. Now listen, cried Hook, and all listened. But not one dared to face the door. Yes, one, Wendy, who all this time had been bound to the mast. It was for neither a scream nor a crow that she was watching. It was for the reappearance of Peter. She had not long to wait. In the cabin, Peter had found the thing for which he had gone in search, the key that would free the children of their manacles. And now they all stole forth, armed with such weapons as they could find. Peter cut Wendy's bonds, and then nothing could have been easier for them all to fly off together. But one thing barred the way. An oath. Hook or me! this time. So when he had freed Wendy, he whispered to her to conceal herself with the others, and himself took her place by the mast, her cloak around him, so that he should pass for her. Then he took a great breath and crowed. To the pirates, it was a voice crying that all the boys lay slain in the cabin, and they were panic-stricken. Hook tried to hearten them. Lads, he said, I thought it out. There's a Jonah aboard. Hi, they snarled. A man with a hook. No, lads, no, it's the girl. Fling the girl overboard. And they made a rush at the figure in the cloak. There's none can save you now, missy, Mullins hissed jeeringly. There's one, replied the figure. Who's that? Peter Pan, the Avenger, came the terrible answer. And as he spoke, Peter flung off his cloak. Twice Hook essayed to speak, and twice he failed. In that frightful moment, I think his fierce heart broke. At last he cried, Cleave him to the brisket! But without conviction. Down, boys, and at them! Peter's voice rang out, and in another moment the clash of arms was resounding through the ship. Had the pirates kept together, it is certain that they would have won. But the onset came when they were all unstrung. Man to man, they were the stronger, but they fought on the defensive only, which enabled the boys to hunt in pairs and choose their quarry. There was little to be heard but the clang of weapons, an occasional screech or splash, and slightly counting monotonously. Five, six, seven, eight, nine... Ten, eleven. I think all were gone when a group of savage boys surrounded Hook, who seemed to have a charmed life as he kept them at bay. Suddenly, he found himself face to face with Peter. So, Pan, said Hook at last, this is all you're doing. Hi, James Hook, came the stern answer. It is all my doing. Proud and insolent youth, said Hook. Prepare to meet thy doom. Dark and sinister man, Peter answered. Have at thee. Without more words they fell to, and for a space there was no advantage to either blade. Peter was a superb swordsman. Hook was scarcely his inferior in brilliancy, but not quite so nimble. Then he sought to close and give the quietus with his iron hook, but Peter doubled under it and, lunging fiercely, pierced him in the rib. At sight of his own blood, the sword fell from Hook's hand, and he was at Peter's mercy. Now! cried all the boys. But with a magnificent gesture, Peter invited his opponent to pick up his sword. Hook did so instantly but with a tragic feeling that Peter was showing good form. Pan, who and what art thou? he cried huskily. I am youth, I am joy, Peter answered. This, of course, was nonsense. 
but it was proof to the unhappy hook that Peter did not know in the least who or what he was, which is the very pinnacle of good form. To it again, he cried despairingly. But Hook was fighting now without hope. James Hook, thou not wholly unheroic figure, farewell, for we have come to his last moment. Seeing Peter slowly advancing upon him through the air with dagger poised, he sprang upon the bulwarks to cast himself into the sea. He did not know that the crocodile was waiting for him. Thus perished James Hook. Seventeen slightly sang out. Wendy, of course, had stood by taking no part in the fight, though watching Peter with glistening eyes. But now that all was over, she became prominent again. She took them into Hook's cabin and pointed to his watch, which was hanging on a nail. It said, Half past one. The lateness of the hour was almost the biggest thing of all. She got them to bed in the pirates' bunks pretty quickly, you may be sure. All but Peter, who strutted up and down on the deck, until at last he fell asleep by the side of Long Tom. By two bells that morning, they were all stirring their stumps. They all donned pirate clothes cut off at the knee, shaved smartly, and tumbled up with the true nautical roll and hitching their trousers. It need not be said who was the captain. A few sharp orders were given, and they turned round and nosed the ship for the mainland. Captain Peter calculated after consulting the ship's chart that if this weather lasted, they should strike the Azores about the 21st of June, after which it would save time to fly. Instead of watching the ship, however, we must now return to that desolate home from which three of our characters had taken heartless flight. Even now we venture into that familiar nursery only because its lawful occupants are on their way home. The only change to be seen in the night nursery is that between nine and six, the kennel is no longer there. When the children flew away, Mr. Darling felt in his bones that all the blame was his for having chained Nana up. Having thought the matter out with anxious care after the flight of the children, he went down on all fours and crawled into the kennel. In the bitterness of his remorse, he swore that he would never leave the kennel until his children came back. And there never was a more humble man than the once proud George Darling as he sat in the kennel of an evening talking with his wife of their children and all their pretty ways. Very touching was his deference to Nana. He would not let her come into the kennel, but on all other matters he followed her wishes implicitly. Every morning the kennel was carried with Mr. Darling in it to a cab which conveyed him to his office, and he returned home in the same way. Something of the strength of character of the man will be seen if we remember how sensitive he was to the opinion of neighbours. It may have been quixotic, but it was magnificent. Soon the inward meaning of it leaked out, and the great heart of the public was touched. Crowds followed the cab, interviews appeared in the better class of papers, and society invited him to dinner and added, do come in the kennel. On that eventful Thursday week, Mrs. Darling was in the night nursery awaiting George's return home. A very sad-eyed woman. We look at her closely and remember the gaiety of her in the old days, all gone now because she has lost her babes. Look at her in her chair where she has fallen asleep. The corner of her mouth is almost withered up. Her hand moves restlessly on her breast as if she had a pain there. Nana had filmy eyes, but all she could do was to put her paw gently on her mistress's lap. And they were sitting together thus when the kennel was brought back. As Mr. Darling puts his head out of it to kiss his wife, we see that his face is more worn than of yore, but it has a softer expression. Social success has not spoilt him, it has made him sweeter. For some time he sat half out of the kennel, talking with Mrs. Darling. Then, feeling drowsy, he curled round in his kennel. "'Won't you play me to sleep?' he asked, on the nursery piano. And as she was crossing to the day nursery, he added thoughtlessly, 
and shut that window. I feel a draught. Oh, George, never ask me to do that. The window must always be left open for them. Always. Always. She went into the day nursery and played, and soon he was asleep. And while he slept, Wendy and John and Michael flew into the room. Oh, no. We have written it so, because that was the charming arrangement planned by them before we left the ship. But something must have happened since then, for it is not they who have flown in. It is Peter and Tinker Bell. Peter's first words tell all. Quick, Tink, he whispered. Close the window. Bar it. That's right. Now, you and I must get away by the door, and when Wendy comes, she will think her mother has barred her out, and she will have to go back with me. Now I understand why, when Peter had exterminated the pirates, he did not return to the island and leave Tink to escort the children to the mainland. This trick had been in his head all the time. He peeped into the day nursery to see who was playing. He whispered to Tink, It's Wendy's mother. She is a pretty lady, but not so pretty as my mother. Her mouth is full of thimbles, but not so full as my mother's was. Of course, he knew nothing whatever about his mother. He peeped in again to see why the music had stopped. And now he saw that Mrs. Darling had laid her head on the box and that two tears were sitting on her eyes. She wants me to unbar the window, thought Peter, but I won't, not I. He peeped again and the tears were still there or another two had taken their place. She's awfully fond of Wendy, he said to himself. He was angry with her now for not seeing why she could not have Wendy. The reason was simple. I'm fond of her too. We can't both have her lady. But the lady would not make the best of it. And he was unhappy. Oh, all right, he said at last and gulped. Then he unbarred the window. Come on, Tink, he cried. We don't want any silly mothers. And he flew away. Thus, Wendy and John and Michael found the window open for them after all. I say, cried John, the kennel. And he dashed across to look into it. Hello, he said. There's a man inside it. It's father, exclaimed Wendy. Surely, said John, he used not to sleep in the kennel. John, Wendy said falteringly, Perhaps we don't remember the old life as well as we thought we did. A chill fell upon them and served them right. It was then that Mrs. Darling began playing again. It's mother, cried Wendy, peeping. Then you are not really our mother, Wendy, asked Michael, who was surely sleepy. Oh, dear, exclaimed Wendy, with her first real twinge of remorse. It is quite time we came back. Let us all slip into our beds and be there when Mother comes in, just as if we'd never been away. So when Mrs. Darling went back to the night nursery to see if her husband was asleep, all the beds were occupied. The children waited for her cry of joy, but it did not come. She saw them, but she did not believe they were there. They could not understand this, and a cold fear fell upon all three of them. Mother, Wendy cried. That's Wendy, she cried, but still she was sure it was the dream. Mother, that's John, she cried. Mother, cried Michael. He knew her now. That's Michael, she cried and she stretched out her arms for the three little selfish children. They would never envelop again. Yes, they did. They went round Wendy and John and Michael, who had slipped out of bed and run to her. George, George, she cried when she could speak. And Mr. Darling woke to share her bliss, and Nana came rushing in. There could not have been a lovelier sight, but there was none to see it except a strange boy who was staring in at the window. 
He had ecstasies innumerable that other children can never know, but he was looking through the window at the one joy from which he must be forever barred. I hope you want to know what became of the other boys. They were waiting below to give Wendy time to explain about them, and when they had counted five hundred they went up. They went up by the stair because they thought this would make a better impression. They stood in a row in front of Mrs. Darling. They said nothing. But their eyes asked her to have them. Of course, Mrs. Darling said at once that she would have them. As for Peter, he saw Wendy once again before he flew away. He did not exactly come to the window, but he brushed against it in passing, so that she could open it if she liked and call to him. That was what she did. Hello, Wendy. Goodbye, he said. Oh dear, are you going away? Yes. Mrs. Darling came to the window, for at present she was keeping a sharp eye on Wendy. She told Peter that she had adopted all the other boys and would like to adopt him too, and she stretched out her arms to him, but he repulsed her. Keep back, lady! No one is going to catch me and make me a man. But where are you going to live? With Tink, in the house we built for Wendy. It will be rather lonely in the evening, Wendy said, sitting by the fire. It doesn't matter, Peter said. Oh, Peter, you know it matters. Well then, come with me to the little house. May I, Mummy? Certainly not. I've got you home again, and I mean to keep you. But he does so need a mother. So do you, my love. Oh, all right, Peter said. Mrs. Darling saw his mouth twitch. And she made this handsome offer to let Wendy go to him for a week every year to do his spring cleaning. This promise sent Peter away quite gay again. You won't forget me, Peter, will you, before spring cleaning time comes? Of course, Peter promised, and then he flew away. He took Mrs. Darling's kiss with him, the kiss that had been for no one else. Peter took quite easily. Funny, but she seemed satisfied. Of course, all the boys went to school, and soon they settled down to being as ordinary as you or me. It is sad to have to say that the power to fly gradually left them. In time, they could not even fly after their hats. Want of practice, they called it, but what it really meant was that they no longer believed. Michael believed longer than the other boys, so he was with Wendy when Peter came for her at the end of the first year. She flew away with Peter in the frock she had woven from leaves and berries in the Neverland, and her one fear was that he might notice how short it had become. But he never noticed; he had so much to say about himself. She had looked forward to thrilling talks with him about old times, but new adventures had crowded the old ones from his mind. Who is Captain Hook? He asked with interest. Don't you remember? She asked, amazed, how you killed him and saved our lives. I forget them after I kill them, he replied carelessly. Wendy was pained too to find the past year was but as yesterday to Peter. But he was exactly as fascinating as ever, and they had a lovely spring cleaning in the little house on the tree tops. Next year he did not come to her. She waited in a new frock because the old ones simply would not meet, but he never came. He came next spring cleaning, and the strange thing was that he never knew he had missed a year. That was the last time the girl Wendy ever saw him. The years came and went without bringing the careless boy, and when they met again, Wendy was a married woman. Years rolled on again, and Wendy had a daughter. She was called Jane. She loved to hear of Peter, and Wendy told her all she could remember in the nursery from which the famous flight had taken place. Ah、oh, me, how time flies! Said Wendy. Does it fly? Asked the artful child. The way you flew when you were a little girl. The way I flew. Do you know, Jane? I sometimes wonder whether I ever did really fly. Yes, you did. The dear old days when I could fly. Why can't you fly now, Mother? Because I'm grown up, dearest. 
When people grow up, they forget the way. Why do they forget the way? Because they are no longer gay and innocent and heartless. What was the last thing Peter ever said to you? The last thing he ever said to me was, Just always be waiting for me, and then some night you will hear me crowing. I often hear it when I'm sleeping, Jane said. Ah, yes, many girls hear it when they are sleeping. But I was the only one who heard it awake. Lucky you, said Jane. And then one night came the tragedy. Jane was asleep in her bed. Wendy was sitting on the floor, very close to the fire, so as to darn, for there was no other light in the nursery. And while she sat darning, she heard a crow. Then the window blew open as of old, and Peter dropped on the floor. He was exactly the same as ever. He was a little boy, and she was grown up. Hello, Wendy, he said, not noticing any difference, for he was thinking chiefly of himself. Hello, Peter, she replied faintly, squeezing herself as small as possible. Where is John? He asked, suddenly missing the third bed. John is not here now, she gasped. Is Michael asleep? He asked with a careless glance at Jane. That is not Michael, she said quickly. Peter looked. Hello, is it a new one? Yes. Boy or girl? Girl. Now surely he would understand, but not a bit of it. Peter, she said faltering, are you expecting me to fly away with you? Of course, that's why I've come. I can't come, she said apologetically. I have forgotten how to fly. I'll soon teach you again. Oh, Peter, don't waste the fairy dust on me. She had risen. And now at last a fear assailed him. What is it? he cried, shrinking. I will turn up the light, she said, and then you can see for yourself. She turned up the light, and Peter saw. He gave a cry of pain, and when the tall, beautiful creature stooped to lift him in her arms, he drew back sharply. I am old, Peter. I am ever so much more than twenty. I grew up long ago. You promise not to! I couldn't help it. I'm a married woman, Peter. No, you're not. Yes. And the little girl in the bed is my baby. No, she's not. But he supposed she was, and he sat down on the floor and sobbed. And Wendy did not know how to comfort him, though she could have done it so easily once. She was only a woman now, and she ran out of the room to try to think. Soon his sobs woke Jane. She sat up in bed and was interested at once. Boy, she said, why are you crying? Peter rose and bowed to her, and she bowed to him from the bed. Hello, he said. Hello, said Jane. My name is Peter Pan, he told her. Yes, I know. I came back for my mother, he explained. To take her to the Neverland. Yes, I know, Jane said. I've been waiting for you. When Wendy returned diffidently, she found Peter sitting on the bedpost, crowing gloriously, while Jane in her nightie was flying round the room in solemn ecstasy. She is my mother, Peter explained. He does so need a mother, Jane said. Yes, I know, Wendy said rather forlornly. No one knows it so well as I. Goodbye, said Peter to Wendy, and he rose in the air, and the shameless Jane rose with him. Wendy rushed to the window. No, no, she cried. It's just for spring cleaning, Jane said. He wants me always to do his spring cleaning. If only I could go with you, Wendy sighed. You see, you can't fly, Jane said. Of course, in the end, Wendy let them fly away together. Our last glimpse of her shows her at the window, 
watching them receding into the sky until they were as small as stars. As you look at Wendy, you may see her hair becoming white and her figure little again, for all this happened long ago. Jane is now a grown-up with a daughter called Margaret. And every spring cleaning time, except when he forgets, Peter comes for Margaret and takes her to the Neverland, where she tells him stories about himself to which he listens eagerly. When Margaret grows up, she will have a daughter who is to be Peter's mother in turn. And thus it will go on. So long as children are gay and innocent and heartless.